Has Christianity in America blown it? I, I happen to mention Christians, and he said, oh, I know those guys. They're the angry people. And how or when should someone leave a church? And later. Forgiveness doesn't mean that what happened to you was okay. Can someone who's been divorced be fully restored? This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. My next guest says that our current Christian culture is blowing it and that we haven't made a significant impact on moving our culture forward in over 30 years. Phil Cook is a filmmaker, media consultant, and the author of the book, The Way Back, How Christians Blew Our Credibility and How We're Going to Get It Back. Uh, Phil, have we really blown it? You're, you're joining us today from Burbank, California. Maybe it's just a California view. <laughs> well, I wish it was, but I'm afraid I work with churches and ministries all over the country, so we've had a, ch a chance to really look closely at the issue. And when you think about it, we haven't moved the dial in a positive way on any single social issue in the last 30 years, not one. And so we started to really look closely at what we've been doing wrong and maybe how to fix it. Yeah. Now, you, you co-authored this book with Jonathan Bach. Uh, Jonathan's a media consultant and uh, works with a lot of uh, a lot of building audiences for uh, television and pictures. That, did you both share the same? Did it kind of just dawn on you both at the same time? or? We've been friends for a long time and spent a lot of late nights over a, a fire pit talking about why our why Christians don't do a better job of engaging the culture today, why we haven't shifted the culture in a more positive direction. So really the book came out of those conversations about how we could do it more effectively. Is it because we haven't shifted it or is it because we're just falling further and further behind as the culture gets more and more liberal? A little, a little of both. We, we keep falling further behind. You know, part of it is we tried boycotts. You know, if you don't say Merry Christmas instead of Happy Holidays, we'll complain. We won't buy your coffee. That hasn't worked any. We tried petition drives online. That hasn't worked. We tried criticism. That hasn't worked. Talked to a television studio executive at a major network the other day. He said that uh, I, I happened to mention Christians. And he said, oh, I know those guys. They're the angry people. All he knows is when we get upset about a show that we don't like. So that's not the way to engage culture, and you don't change people's hearts by being mad at them. Are they just seeing the extremes? I mean, No, I don't think we're seeing the extremes. Mm -hmm. I think they do very often. But the truth is, we started looking at how Christians are living our life out there. We went to four of the biggest researchers in the country to find out how Christians are living their life because we thought, well, maybe it should start with us. And what we found, honestly, was pretty shocking. Well, is it, is it the fact that we, we, we don't have a, a, anything to sell to the culture today or that we don't believe in what we're selling to the culture? I think it's we don't believe with what with uh, believe in what we're selling. Mm. I think we don't have the confidence in the product that we're selling, if you will, to really go out and share it and make a difference. This is this is this leadership or is it the, the body of Christ, the people sitting in the pews or, or where does it, what does it come down to? Is it fear? It's, it's all of us. Let me give you some examples. When we went to these researchers to find out how we're living our lives every day, we found out that 20% of people in America show up at church on a regular basis. So we really looked close at those 20%. And what we found was kind of horrifying, frankly. For instance, 40% of church-going Christians read the Bible once a month, rarely or never. That's almost half of the people in church, in the pews, every week, read the Bible once a month, rarely or never. We discovered that church attendance, the bar is so low on church attendance today that if you show up just 19 times a year, you're considered a regular now. That's three out of eight Sundays. That's all you need to be considered a regular anymore. And when it comes to prayer, we found out that 63% of Christians today in church believe prayer is important. And we thought that was good. Yeah. Until we realize the flip side that 37 percent, more than a third of Christians in the church today, don't believe prayer is important. And of course, tithing is brutal. Less than 10 percent of people out there give 10 percent. So when you look at those statistics, you start to realize why we're not making a greater impact in the culture today. When we look at the, the failure in a sports team, we're either going to look at the coaching, we're going to look at the management, or we're going to look at the players. Where should we look? I think we all bl share the blame. I think number one, pastors are not calling us to the level of commit commitment we need. Yeah. I think we've started worshiping in many ways a, a false god. We don't think of ourselves as idol worshipers. You know, when our when my pastor goes on vacation, we don't make a golden calf in the lobby of the church. <laughs> right. However, we've started worshiping this god that looks a lot like the god of the Bible. But this God that we worship understands why we don't have time to go to church. He knows we're busy. He understands why we don't have time to pray or read the Bible. Uh, he understands why I'm cheating on my wife because he wants me to be happy, right? So what we've discovered is we've become incredible idol worshipers. We've just started putting our faith in a God that 
like I say, looks like the God of the Bible, but really when you get down to it, it's not. And is this just the last decade or does this go back? Is, is, is there some kind of a foundational issue that started way back when? Oh, I think the seeds go back. But the truth is we've seen a traumatic shift in the last 20 to 30 years that's really very powerful. When you look at the statistics and the research out there and the impact we've made or lack of impact we've made on the culture, you really start to see that it's incredibly it's, it's dangerous, quite frankly, because of the direction the culture is moving. Now, I've, I've heard people in the past say there's uh, one of two things. One, we, we took prayer out of school. We want to blame something. Or we, uh, you know, Roe versus Wade came in in the early 70s. We had the big sexual revolution. The church didn't know how to address that. And we just kind of sat back and, and didn't know where to fight, didn't know how yeah. to fight. Well, let me tell you what happened to the early church. You know, when you go back 2,000 years to the early church, they literally did change the world. Mm -hmm. um, it was really interesting. When we studied them, we discovered that they had no power, no money, no influence. They couldn't change laws. They couldn't complain. They couldn't boycott, but they could act. And so, for instance, with infanticide, you know, in the Roman era, if you didn't want a child after it was born, you just let it die of exposure. It was so common, incredibly common during that period. But Christians, these crazy Christians, would go out under cover of night and they couldn't complain, so they would get these kids that had been abandoned, bring them into their family, raise them as their own, and other members of the church would contribute to pay for the expense of that. And the Romans could not wrap their head around why anybody would do it. And after a while, historians today tell us Christians did so many of these kind of things that it forced the Romans to rethink who these people are and who is this God they talk about all the time. And they tell us today that that was a key reason the Roman Empire started to shift finally fell and then Christianity exploded in a relatively short amount of time. How they acted, they did things that so baffled the culture, it completely changed the way they thought. So you bring this forward to today. I mean, they, they were baffling the culture and, and, and the things they were doing. How do we bring this forward to today? I mean, what's, what's a, a, an example of how we bring that forward? Great question. So the book asks, how can we today do things that so astonish the culture that they're forced to rethink who we are and who is this God that we serve? One of the areas, for instance, and there, there are small areas that you could do in your church or in your community or in your neighborhood. And there's big areas. A big area, for instance, is foster care. And we looked at foster care. And although there's some wonderful foster parents out there, overall, the problem, the, 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 you know, it's broken. Foster care is really broken. Only 1% of foster care kids ever go to college and graduate. Uh, it, they just perpetuate the cycle. And we found out there's 350,000 foster kids in America. How, how do we solve a problem that big until we realize there's 300,000 churches in America? If we got serious about this, if every church in America took one kid, it could literally eliminate the need for foster care. So my question is, what would the culture think? Even if they hated Christians, what would the culture think if because of us, we eliminated the need for foster care in this country, it would start to shift the way they think about Christians. Yeah. So do we actually bring our culture, the Christian culture, into today's culture? Do we influence that culture or do we somehow become part of it and change it from the inside? I think there's a little bit of both. There's no question that I think, uh, for instance, I have friends here in Hollywood where I live that are working in the industry, inside Hollywood, trying to change the industry from the inside. Others, friends of mine, create Christian movies or more Christian value entertainment. So I think there's a place for both. The key thing, though, is we just need to be committed to living out our Christian faith every single day. Living it out is, we've discovered, the key. And where do, you, where do we get that incentive, that, that, that new call to that vision? We've got to live it out. I mean, we, uh, how, well, do, you know how, how do we get organized as a, as, a, as a new team? That's a great, that's a great question. You know, it's interesting that um, the Center for Bible Engagement did an interesting study that said that when you engage the Bible four or more times a week, your behavior actually changes. If you don't read the yeah. Bible, if you read the Bible three or less times, your behavior doesn't change at all. But when you start reading the Bible four or more times a week, your propensity for alcoholism goes down, your propensity for being a jerk goes down. I mean, all <laughs> kinds of behavioral things drop and you literally visibly change your life. So I think we need to start getting back into the Bible, getting back into scripture and being committed to what the Bible really calls us to do and how it calls us to live. If, if, if people saw that, if people really saw that, I have a friend in the UK, J. John, who's an evangelist. He says, you wanna be a missionary? Great, go next door. If we just started with the people we know next door in the office, living out the life God calls to live, we'd have a remarkable impact on the culture. And the, pl the, the, the time is now, and we can fill that place at this point. The book itself, is there a happy ending? 
<laughs> I haven't read the whole thing yet. Yes, there is, there is, because we, we present five or six things that we believe we could start doing today that would really impact culture. And we also offer the readers, you know, think of things in your family, your community, in your office, your neighborhood that you could do that would start to make a difference. My co-writer, Jonathan Bach, while we were writing the book, he um, decided to throw a block party in his neighborhood, didn't know very many people on the street, felt convicted, threw a block party, and guess what? Every single person came. I mean, who, who doesn't want to go to a party? They started to get to know each other. They started to share their faith. And he started to see a real difference in his own neighborhood. So it's not a big thing. We don't have to launch a national ministry. We just need to start living the life God's called us to live, start reaching out to people, and it can make a huge difference. So, so we don't need a new motto of any kind. Don't need a new model. You know <laughs> we got what? The that 2,000 year old model of what God called us to in the early yeah. church days, that really works. Right. Well, the info on the book, The Way Back, How Christians Blew Our Credibility and How We Get It Back, where can they get the book and uh, maybe that blueprint? You can get it anywhere. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, bookstores will order it for you. It's available everywhere. And I would love for people, we've had enormous response from churches who are now starting to use it as a small group resource. Now they're getting small groups in the church reading it and figuring out what they could do in their neighborhood to make this kind of difference. So I'd encourage people, try it out and uh, see where it can take. After the break. How or when should someone leave a church? I internalize it. I say, what did I do wrong? Matter of fact, when people... So you take it personally? I do. Yeah. That and more when Viewpoint returns. We often hear why people leave church. Today we're going to get this other side of why they left. We're going to talk to a pastor uh, that's really been involved in some of that story. I think every pastor has yes. talked to either people or they've seen people leave and they've yes. talked to them, why did you go? Yep. It's a, uh, some pastors really are like armadillos, Bob. Their, th their skin's pretty thick mm -hmm. and they kind of brush it off but not me. I internalize it. I say, what did I do wrong? Matter of fact, when people... So you take it personally. I do. Yeah. Yeah, they're my people, my mm -hmm. church. My, it's God's church. It's Christ's church, yeah. but as an under-shepherd. And when I can, when people will let me, I'll sit down with them and say, I really am interested in why you're leaving. So it's and like an exit interview. <laughs> it is, as much as they'll let me. Yeah. And I'll say, did I drop the ball? Was I inattentive? Were you treated rudely? Was there somebody in the church that dropped the ball with you? Uh, it's not... And I never approach it like, if I can just be what you want me to be, maybe you'll stay. Yeah. Not from that perspective Not at all. Not even a perspective that you'll, you're, you're going to fix it. No, no. Mm -hmm. But just try to find out. And sometimes you find little things that you can, in fact, fix. But the majority of the time, it's not that way. Mm -hmm. So in the majority of cases, are people being honest with you about why they're leaving or what are the reasons you're hearing? I'd say it's about a 50-50 split. I think there's a lot of lying mm -hmm. goes on. They don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, they just don't want to tell you the truth. No. Is it different for you if, if somebody's leaving your church, going someplace else, or they're just leaving the church? Well, here's how I say it, and I've talked to several people directly, and this is what I say to them. It really hurts me that going nowhere is better than staying at our church. Yeah. And it does, mm -hmm. it does hurt me because, and again, this might be 15% of the people who would leave. And many times they're not mad. They're not upset with me. Uh, they just, they do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. and, and most of the time, those people do not cloak it with, well, the Holy Spirit's leading me X, Y, Z. They just don't go anywhere. And when I call them or drop them an email later, months later, they haven't gone anywhere. They made no effort to plug back into another Bible-believing church. Are, are, are those people that uh, don't want somebody speaking into their life, they're going to church either for entertainment, they're going to church for their daily or their weekly dose of the sermon, but they really don't want to sit under the authority. And, and I, I, it's hard to yeah. say this, but the authority yeah. of the church, the authority of the, of, right. of the Word of God. Uh, it's not been my experience uh, that people... Uh, don't want you to speak into their lives. For the most part, and I say this tongue in cheek, mm -hmm. but for the most part, uh, most people can sit in a, during a sermon and they can put up with whatever you've got to say for 40 minutes and then do what they want. Mm -hmm. Now I'm being negative when I say yeah. that. Uh, but So I don't think most people that leave 
uh, would say that because I got too close to them, too close to a subject, they didn't agree with my theology. Mm -hmm. For the most part, and we say this among pastors all the time, uh, we say, hey, look, there's a burning bush over there. Hey, the revival's over there. And sometimes yeah. we say, well, not all pastors, but I do, <laughs> will say, hey, this church over here is growing by leaps and bounds, and people leave to go see the burning bush. Yeah. And it's the latest and greatest. It's the latest and greatest the, thing. The, the, and there the are of the month. there are times where that's where God's leading them. But I, I tell our people from time to time, I was never a racehorse. I will never be a racehorse. Mm -hmm. I'm a plow horse. Now the other side of that, people that are church hopping, yeah. somebody new comes in. Yeah. Do you care to know where they're coming from or what that what that relationship has been in the past with other pastors or other churches? Well, that is an awesome question. Um, what I do is I don't, I don't usually call the pastor and say so-and-so was in my church mm -hmm. unless they tell me where they came from. Mm -hmm. They come two or three Sundays, then I call their pastor and say, I just want you to know uh, Bob and Mary Smith were at our mm -hmm. church Sunday morning and they'll say, that's fine, they're looking for a church, they're not happy here. Mm -hmm. And I say, that's all I want to know. Uh, and I give people opportunity to start with a clean piece of paper mm -hmm. with me. And the plain truth is, anybody in leadership knows this. It's not rocket science. Right. That people who misbehave here, it's just a matter of time before they'll misbehave mm -hmm. here. There are times when, when someone's been in a church for a long time or maybe a short time, yes. that they really say, this doesn't fit with me. It's either right. my, my family doesn't fit in the relationship. Right. Is there a right way to do that? Is there a right way to say, we're gonna we're gonna leave and yes. no animosity but is there a right yeah. way to break up and are there good reasons well break up is a really good <laughs> a really good metaphor because if you're gonna break up with your girlfriend you don't do it a piece at a time you, you know you you know you kind of that's, that's important you have to kind of yeah. be honest and say this isn't going the direction mm -hmm. I thought and so what I prefer obviously can't speak for other pastors but I prefer if somebody says I really feel like it's time for us to go to another church, even if we don't know where that is. Mm -hmm. Now that sounds weird, but I'm okay with that. Yeah. Then I look at them and say, would you please just be honest with me of what's going on, mm -hmm. if anything. And sometimes it's me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I've dropped the ball, made mistakes, but other times it's just, it's just a season. Mm -hmm. and, and there are legitimate reasons why people leave. And I try to sort that all out and affirm them, but uh, I just like people to be honest mm -hmm. with me. It's painful sometimes, it is. Is it right that they stay there while they shop around? Yes, for me it is. Is, is it? And it you is. let them know that. that is, yeah. I know that yeah. you're not fitting here. I know that you're looking for another new church. Yes. And it's okay. But let me tell you why. Yeah. Because many, and I say this with just a little tiny bit of pat on my mm -hmm. own back, just a little, mm -hmm. that sometimes people go out into the mm -hmm. wilderness of this whole church shopping thing, trying to find God's heart. Yeah. And they come back and say, you know what? Things are pretty good here. The preaching here is is all right. Yeah. But we've already told you goodbye. Yeah, and I say, okay. Welcome back. <laughs> Somebody spoke something in my life long yeah. time, long, long time yeah. ago, Bob, and it makes so much sense that the only reason why somebody's coming into your church is because it stinks less than the church they left. Ooh. <laughs> now, if you take that in its most literal yeah. thing, you'd say that's yeah. terrible, yeah. except yeah. People have reasonable needs in worship, mm -hmm. in teaching, in relationship, in service, and many times they do come to my church or somebody else's or leave. We have pastors that serve larger churches, I know personally, and they say when people come to us and say, we're looking for a smaller church, they say, why don't you try Union Chapel? Mm -hmm. And when I have somebody come to me that says, I'm looking for something that has a larger, more places to serve, I say, why don't you try Baptist Temple or Lima Community mm -hmm. or some other church? And these are wonderful men. Mm -hmm. And so that's legitimate. Well, what's not really right, I don't think, is, is if people just try to fade away. That's painful. They come to church once a month and then they're yeah. gone for six weeks and they come back again. And they just, they don't want the confrontation. They don't. They just want to fade away. I think, in, number one, that's dishonest. Mm -hmm. And number two, uh, that's not how the body is supposed to work. The body oh, right. of Christ, the church, with him as the head, is the weirdest duck that ever existed. Mm -hmm. But he put it together because we have to work through our conflicts, our problems, our joys, our successes together. Mm -hmm. And we need each other. And that's, if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I'm thinking about going somewhere else, I'm just, it's just time. 
I say, I want God's best for you. Yeah. That's yeah. all I want. That's a great prayer for that, someone. And that's all I really yeah. want. Can someone who's been divorced be fully restored in the church? That and more when Viewpoint returns. Divorce is often looked at as a tragic end. My next guest would agree to that, but also believes it is what brought him to help others in their marriage. Joining me is Mark Yunkin. He's a professor at Valor Christian College and wrote this book, Make Like Lazarus, A Biblical Perspective of Divorce and Remarriage. And Mark, divorce is a sin. It can be forgiven, but in many churches, it's still looked on as a, something that people have a really difficult time accepting. Yeah, the, uh, the I guess, 1980s Christian folk singer Don Francisco on his live album mm -hmm. said that we think of divorce as the second unforgivable sin. And we're talking about today, talking about just being restored, talking about there's a lot of forgiveness involved. But there's a, there's a chapter in, in, in your book as we get towards the end of it, chapter 7, the ultimate victory, the most important post-divorce step you can take. Tell me about that chapter. Well, that step is forgiveness. And it can... It, it is total forgiveness. It is forgiveness of everyone involved in your situation. Now, how, how, concrete, so how concrete is that forgiveness? When I'm, when I'm, when I'm talking about that is, do you go to some place, someone and, and say, I've, I've forgiven you? Are they insulted by that? I mean, how concrete is that step of forgiveness? Is it just within your own spirit that I've forgiven my former spouse? Or do I let that spouse know that I've, I really have forgiven you? I think that there is a lot to be said for maybe having a, if, if it's possible, mm -hmm. it's not always not possible, possible yes. to have a, uh, to sit down and say, this hurt me deeply. I had a grudge for a long time, but I have forgiven you. It's critical that, that you forgive. It's not necessary, in my view, that other people accept that mm -hmm. forgiveness you need to forgive them as Jesus forgave them. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean that what happened to you was okay. It doesn't mean that you have to reconcile a relationship. That might be possible. Mm -hmm. If you and a former spouse have children together, you've got to reconcile to a civil relationship for the sake mm -hmm. of your children. But it doesn't mean that you have to, you know, everything has to be, be good again. Mm -hmm. um, if you are remarried and finally forgive your, your first spouse, it doesn't mean that you divorce the second spouse and, and get back, back, to, back together. That, why wreck two marriages? But, but even before that second marriage, uh, you're, you're trying to forgive. You're trying to be fully forgiven. You're trying to be restored so that you can enter into a second relationship possibly. Is there pressure from the church or this small group to want to put you back together? I think the church can put a lot of pressure mm -hmm. on you. What I, try, what I do is simply ask, do you know that it's over? Mm -hmm. And most of the time people say, yes. Yeah, I know it's over. There's no, there's no going back. There's no way that we can get back together and so on. But if there's... But, but my advice for people that are considering divorce is don't. That's a good question right there. I mean, if, if you're saying you're considering divorce, you're seeing this thing fall apart, and you say, let's do a trial separation, let's get counseling. Uh, what, what about separation? I mean, you'd say, okay, I'm, we're going to live apart. We're not going to get a divorce. Is there, what, what's involved well, in that? Well, sometime, sometimes separation is a good thing. If, there mm -hmm. has, if the relationship is devolved to the point that there is violence or the threat yeah, of yeah. violence, then uh, a, a mother, a mother of, of young children in particular needs to do everything that she can to protect herself sure. and to protect her, her children. Um, and very often we say, whoop, that's it, that we can't, you know, that, that's never going to happen again. But we serve a miracle working God. Mm -hmm. And I have seen him restore some relationships that, uh, that seem to be too far gone to uh, restore, and yet they have, they have been restored. Mm -hmm. And in other situations that look very much the same, the couple goes their separate ways and, and eventually both remarry and... 
um, God can make something out of that too. There's, there's people watching right now who believe I've gone through a divorce. I, we were both in the church. My future's a wreck right now. There's no way that I, I can ever remarry again. There's no way I can ever become active in the church again uh, because, of, because of the sin in my life. What, what would you say to that person? I would say that uh, if there is sin in your life, that's the good news because sins can be forgiven. We serve a God who forgives. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's... If there's too much history in that church, well, there's churches opening up every week. <laughs> and there might be one that, there, there almost certainly will be one that, uh, that will accept you. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be a good, a good way to figuratively make a fresh start as well. When I was separated from my first wife, I physically moved about 30 miles away. There, there can be a need for a fresh start like that. Um, and, and that's possible for many people, not for all. But ultimately, if there's hope in all of this, it's, it's going to start with forgiveness. It has to. Yeah. It has to. Uh, forgiveness can be the most healing thing that you do for your relationships and, and actually for yourself right. as well. Well, it's all in the book, Make Like Lazarus, and uh, a biblical perspective of divorce and remarriage. Mark, thank you very much. Uh, I know we've given a lot of people a lot of hope right now. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.